morning, I mean, good afternoon. I am Jason Medlock. I'm the host of Expansion of Consciousness. And tonight we will be uh, having a great time with Tony Civilelli. Uh, we'll be doing some live remote viewing sessions. And when we talked about this the last time with Tony, a number of you uh, expressed that, hey, we want Tony to come back. Tony didn't, didn't get to finish everything. And uh, it was sort of my fault because I had the show scheduled for a 30 minute segment and Tony had his his set up for, you know, a little more than an hour. So Tony and I worked together and I wanted to get him back. But this time I wanted him to do a live session. And he said, I want to teach these people. I want to teach all these people how to use scientific remote, remote viewing. And when you're using scientific remote viewing, you're trying to locate an unknown object in any time, space, anywhere in the universe. So without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and bring Tony on. My man, Tony, how are you today? Good, Jason. Thank you for having me back. Good, good, good. And I know, um, I, like I explained to the audience, I tried to squeeze a genius into a box, and you can't do that. We got to let you expand. <laughs> we'll find one, and then we'll we'll try to put the genie back into the bottle. So Absolutely. So uh, go we ahead. I, I know, I know. Okay. So I know that, uh, uh, can we just go ahead and just kind of recap a little bit about what we're doing tonight. I and will. You first off, explain the scientific remote viewing, and I know you're going to get into it, uh, just so we can get the audience uh, familiar. One yeah, thing I would tell you guys I'm gonna tonight. Do all of that. Yep. Um, yeah. We're going to do all of that, um, and that will all be through the PowerPoint slides. And what I want to do is we're going to do three quick sessions with the audience. One will be from myself to just do a total demonstration of what it looks like. The second one they'll participate in, then we'll have a short break, and then we'll have an actual first scientific remote viewing session with phases one and three for your audience. There are five phases, but you can actually do scientific remote viewing with three phases, and they'll see how it's done and get a taste for it tonight. And the only thing I ask is that everybody pretty much have uh, several sheets of clean paper or a notepad and a free flowing pen. So if they do not have that yet, we want to grab those things and um, get ready to actually do a little bit of remote viewing uh, live here tonight on your show. Well, I have my paper right here. I have my free flowing pen. I have a one, uh, I have a 0.7, okay. 0.7 ballpoint pen or point or 1.0. I like, I like one, I like 0.7 because it's very fine. 1.0 typically kind of bleeds a little bit on the paper. Um, right. So, so um, I, I, I know I know that because I've worked with Tony so much. And right. and even a pencil work will work if you can't find a pen handy. It, 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 those things will work. But preferably, if anybody goes on to take a course, you want to use a, a good free-flowing pen. But for today, a, a, a decent pen and a pencil with several, you know, five, six, seven sheets of clean white paper will be best. So what we'll do is we'll remind them again before we get started. But let's let's yeah. get back, let's get back to you. We we need to, we want to we want to dig off into Tony uh, and and figure out figure you out a little bit more. Well, I mean, everything was pretty much said about me on the first show. Some of my history with some of the UFO research and uh, you know my missing time episode when I was seven years old, um, and that got me into the whole idea of uh, you know looking into science fiction, UFOs. I read Chariots of the Gods in the seventh grade, and that kind of stuck with me. And then as time went on in the early 90s, I saw the TV uh, Fox show uh, Alien Autopsy, and I got interested in UFOs, the Roswell crash. I've had trips out to Roswell, out to Area 51, Dreamland, saw different things, took pictures. That's all in the first show. If people, people want to go back to that first show, it was like a half hour, 40 minutes that we did. Um, but I didn't get too much into the whole um, remote viewing aspect of it, but it was because of ufology that I got interested in remote viewing because I came across a book. And that's pretty much where I can start, um, you know, with this show right here, because I will go into a little bit of remote viewing history and definitely my history with remote viewing, as opposed to the first time we mostly went into it, Jason, about my personal history about um, missing time. Uh, UFO sightings, uh, my following of science fiction, all the reading, all the research, all my trips to all the different locations, the conferences, my speaking at different conferences, my book, Ambassadors to the Stars, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, uh, do a quick um, show intro. I am Jason Metlock. I'm the host of Expansion of Consciousness. 
uh, log on to www.expansionofconsciousness.net. Sign up to our newsletter so that we can get you information. Uh, if you want to follow us, uh, you can follow us on YouTube. Just simply type in expansion of consciousness. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, expansion of consciousness. Just that's the only thing you have to type in. And I want you guys to know how to find Tony Civilaly. www.learnremoteviewing.net. www.learnremoteviewing.net. Look Tony up. Go to his website. He is very affordable. He's reasonable. He can teach you skills that <laughs> that will you know, pretty much hard to get. I mean, people specialize in this type of training and Tony is one of those guys who he's a very, very good teacher. You'll see tonight. Yeah. So, so Tony, I we'll appreciate that. Jason. Yeah, I have a history as a, a personal trainer and nutrition consultants. I've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with people before and groups uh, as far as training and I've done definitely different group sessions with people live and also zoom wise with uh, remote viewing as well. Great. Okay. So without, uh, uh, any further ado, we'll go ahead and get this thing up and get it going. There we go. Okay, so first I just want to say thank you to Jason for having me here on Expansion of Consciousness. And thank you to all uh, you that are with Expansion of Consciousness to join us tonight. And hopefully you'll enjoy your introduction to basic scientific remote viewing, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Also, I always say thank you to my professor, Courtney Brown, and the Farsight Institute, where I learned most of uh, how to do the remote viewing, and the Monroe Institute, and instructors Joe McMonaco and Skip Atwater, and several others as well. Uh, this is all in my humble opinion uh, and how I understand what I'm going to discuss. Also, for participation purposes, again, uh, several sheets of clean white sheets of paper and a free-flowing pen, if possible, or even a pencil will do. I've gathered uh, some help here from some emoji interns to kind of keep it on the light side as well. So they're out and about throughout these slides. Uh, this evening's agenda, approximately 20 minutes. I already went over my own history in the previous show. Then we'll get into no easy explanation for remote viewing, a short remote viewing history and a bit of my training with remote viewing. And then for approximately 50 minutes, I'll introduce you to basic scientific remote viewing. I'll demonstrate the protocols. You'll all, the audience will have a practice target We'll take a break and then one more actual target after that. What is remote viewing first? What it is not, remote viewing is actually not channeling. It's not psychic readings. It's not fortune telling. And it's not even an out of body experience or astral travel either. There are no easy explanations for exactly what remote viewing is. In fact, several involved with the research over the years have even changed some of their explanations of what remote viewing is. Yet this type of thing has been going on perhaps throughout the ages. I'm not a scientist, yet this concept has been explored scientifically. There are links on my page, and some scientific measures and the metaphysical are no question involved with what we call remote viewing. Um, the electron uh, interface, that could be one part of it. It all goes back to the double slit experiment in the uh, late 1800s. Different scientists went back and forth where they would take an electron, put it in an electron gun, and shoot it out. Electrons are a very small part of an atom, and actually they would make it to where there would be a single slit. And you see the number two here, they would, the single electron would just go through the slit and remain an electron. But when they had two slits, that's why it's called the double slit experiment, the electron would actually break itself in half, go through the two different slits, and somehow come back out of the two different sides and become one particle in space time again. So the whole idea was that there had to be some type of communication going on between those electron halves in order to split up and come back again. And Albert Einstein actually called this spooky action at a distance. And um, it was named actually with scientific terms called quantum entanglement. Yes. Yep. And that's another demonstration of it. Um, and this went on through early, the early 1900s, 1920s, 1940s, 50s, etc. Other ways of explaining it is there's some type of an electron interface throughout all of us. Um, everything, thoughts, our energy, um, you know, in the smallest particles can maybe pick this up. Um, so like the brain could be a, the spinal cord, a type of antenna and be able to pick up different types of thought patterns at, um, you know, when you practice this type of thing. 
something like Twin Telepathy by Guylin Playfer. Um, he did a lot of research with this. There's been definitely documented cases where people, twins especially, something would happen to one and another twin, the other, the other sibling would be uh, miles away or even in a different state. And they would know something that had happened, had gone on. There was just some type of an electron interface, uh, you could call it, there as well. It was some type of a neural network highway that we're all part of. Um, Edgar Casey, you know, we know about psychics. We've heard about things like that before. Shamans, oracles, medicine men, things like that have all had different claims and stakes that they could communicate um, through other dimensions or other realms. There's some type of, again, energy interface when we get into quantum physics it could become more of a, an electron type of interface that we just looked at a few moments ago jacques valet um a ufologist also a astrophysicist and a mathematician he also worked with the stanford research institute group in the early 1970s that helped develop uh remote viewing he described it as a consciousness type of network. He actually went on to say in his quote is, I propose to describe consciousness as the process by which informational associations are retrieved and traversed. The illusion of time and space would be merely a side effect of consciousness as they traverse the associations to get information. Scientific remote viewing is a structured methodology of gaining data based on scientific protocols that allows information to be transferred from the subconscious mind to the conscious mind to pen and then onto paper from a distant location or a different time. All done with one's five senses, taste, sight, touch, sound, and smell without being there firsthand. This can be construed, construed as a, a form of ESP, which is extrasensory perception. The history of remote viewing is at my website as well, the www.learnremoteviewing.net. Russell Tarr gives it in, uh, a, a lecture there. It's 30 minutes long, but he goes through all of it pretty well in depth. Um, I'll go into it for just a couple minutes here shortly. Also, He also has a book, The Reality of ESP. So basically there's scientific facts, scientific studies with all of this that goes on, that has gone on, and Stanford Research Institute put a lot of time and money into this, and the military came in afterwards. The famous SRI. Yep. And a brief history of remote viewing was during the early 1970s when the aforementioned Russell Targ, who was a, um, a physicist, and Hal Putoff, another scientist, and Charles Tart, a uh, psychologist. Um, they all had an interest in parapsychology, and they worked out at Stanford Research Institute. What they did is they got a hold of, a, in, of Ingo Swan, who was a noted um, psychic at the time. He was at the, in the East Coast in New York, and he was also an artist, a painter. But they brought him out from the East Coast to the West Coast, and what they did is they developed different protocols and phases over the course of several months. And they produced psychic-like effects, and they called this initially in the early 1970s remote viewing. Well. The military had also uh, been dabbling into this type of thing as well in the uh, late 60s and early 70s. And they got wind that the group out of SRI was doing some successful research with this. And so the intelligence community got a hold of the group out of SRI, Stanford Research Institute, and said, you know what, we've been dabbling into this ourselves a little bit. Um, we'd like to know, would you like an exploratory grant to take this to the next level? And the group out of SRI said, yes, we would. So they gave them a grant for quite a bit of money at that time. And what they did, the group out of SRI, the scientists in English one, is they brought in a couple other scientists that had an interest in this type of thing. And then they brought in several other so-called psychics. And within a few short months, they started tweaking the remote viewing procedures. And again, their their information and the content they got was um, pretty, pretty good. And the military was once again interested. And they said, well, you know what? Do you think you can train some of our people how to do this, what you call remote viewing? And they said, yes, they would. And they were definitely up for the challenge of this. And so they interviewed, oh, heck, maybe 30 or 40 people. And um, they came up with six initial people, roughly it was six people that went out to SRI and they were trained by uh, Ingo Swan and also uh, uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. And they became the first quote unquote psychic warriors that the intelligence community employed. And this went back and forth and they also expanded a place on the East Coast out of Fort Meade, Maryland. And again, this was in the 1970s. And Nearly 22 years this went back and forth, and it went under various names. Uh, 
Gandola Wish, Project Grill, Grill Flame, Stargate, etc. In the RSI, Spies was born and quite a bit of money was spent on this. And a lot of the people that were involved with the remote viewing program, especially out of the military, they had a commonality. A lot of them were, were artists, artists. A lot of them were very creative. Uh, several of them had near-death experiences. Some of them had out-of-body experiences. Some of them had seen ghostly apparitions. Some of them had um, UFO sightings. And the military knew that there was some type of uh, extra sensory perception that was going on here and Stanford research was basically proving it without question you know in the scientific world that it was possible and it was doable and so they had a good marriage there and they did different type of programs and they looked at different targets and you know uh, spy targets all those different types of things and what happened is in the um early 1990s, as this was going on, some of this started leaking out in the general populace and the History Channel got wind of it. And what they did is they approached a group out of SRI and the military and said, well, we find this fascinating that the military is working with psychics and psychic phenomena. We'd like to do a documentary on it. Well, the, the military didn't disagree with it. They thought it'd be more trouble than it was worth at first. So they just said, you know what? Okay, we can do it, but we, we want to say on how this is put together. So what they did is they, uh, the History Channel sent out a fellow by the name of James Schnabel. He was a science writer and a journalist and also an author. And he started conducting interviews with some of the people that were involved in the program at SRI. He found out that um, Russia was actually doing it maybe even before the United States. Yep. Um, they had some Canadian ties. And uh, Schnabel got really interested in this whole idea. So he started writing a book about it on the side. Well, the documentary came out in 1993 and it was titled The Real X-Files, which coincidentally was the same year the TV series X-Files came out. And after that came out, the cat was out of the bag until the military had a plan and they basically hired an outside party to come in and take a look at everything. Um, and they did. And they came back after a couple short months of looking at it and said, you know what, we don't think you're, you know, the resources you're putting into it are worth the results you're really getting, even though you're getting some results, it's not really top-notch results, not the money you're putting into it, the resources, the time, etc. So they kind of, you know, backdoored the way into closing the program down. Um, and after that, there was still, you know, rumors that it was going on, etc. And this is where I became involved as I saw a documentary that the second documentary was put out on the Nightline TV series. And I remember watching this and thinking to myself, wow, who would have thought this? The military was working with psychics and psychic phenomena. Yeah. So... Uh, a couple weeks went by, I come across the, the real X-Files, the repeat on the History Channel, um, and it was a little bit longer. It was at roughly about an hour. That was an hour-long show. The one I saw initially on uh, Nightline was just a half hour. And one of the military remote viewers was being interviewed by James Schnabel, and he said sometimes when they were looking at really sensitive targets, things like underground missile silos, biological weapons depots, nuclear submarines, things of that ilk, these unidentified flying lights would start coming in and out of these sessions and these military remote viewers were identifying them as actual UFOs. And that really caught my attention. So I made it a point to go out and get Mr. Schnabel's book, Remote Viewers, The Secret History of America's Psychic Spies, because I wanted to know all about UFOs from a extrasensory perception point of view, what kind of information I could garnish with that. But I didn't come across that book initially, Jason, I, but I came across a second book to my surprise called Cosmic Voyage, it was titled, by a professor out of Emory University named Courtney Brown. He was a teacher of nonlinear mathematics and social sciences. And he teamed up with one of the ex-military remote viewers, and they used the tool of remote viewing to look at the idea of UFOs, potential extraterrestrials visiting Earth. So this book was really what I was looking for in the first place. So I bought that book and I read it. Quite interesting. Um, first part of it was basically about the people who were part of the program for a while, how much training they had put in it. The bulk of the book was the sessions between Professor Brown and the ex-military remote viewer. And they came to the conclusion that there was not one race of what we would call extraterrestrials, or I call them not of this earth intelligence coming here. There were several groups that had been coming here and they had been doing so for a long time and their agendas varied. Um, so after I got done reading that book, I called the Farsight Institute where Courtney Brown was um, the head of this particular group that was involved with remote viewing. And uh, they were telling me on the phone after I had answered 
they had answered a couple of questions accordingly that they're going to be teaching civilians how to do scientific remote viewing. And uh, the lady the secretary was also a viewer herself. She asked me, well, it sounds like you have a real interest in this. Would you like to learn? We're teaching civilians now. And I said to her, I remember saying to her, I don't think I'm quite ready for this now, but I'll definitely keep it in mind. And she said, that would be great. We advise that you do some meditation or learn meditation before you come out here and do this. So I hung up the phone thinking to myself, well, I'm just not ready for that yet because I just don't feel comfortable with it. But after thinking about it um, uh, a couple of days, I slept on it. I, I then took the first step and I joined um, what was called the um, Transcendental Meditation. I learned that through the Maharishi Vedic schools here. I also took a course in um, subliminal messages as well. And I reread the book Cosmic Voyage. And that was about six weeks after I had talked to the uh, secretary at the Farsight Institute. And then I called him back and said, you know what? I think I'm ready to take this course now. So I went out there in 1997. And I, along with like 14 or 15 other people in this picture here, we took the course, uh, the Voyager course of basic scientific remote viewing. And it was quite an experience for me. Um, I was a personal trainer uh, in the fitness and all of that, and I was in good shape, but I remember I didn't lift anything really more than a pen, but I was pretty exhausted at the end of that week because my brain got exercised way more than I had been accustomed to. And after that class, they said, if you want to continue doing this type of thing, you know, we're going to have more advanced classes coming up in the near future, but they advised to maybe go to the Monroe Institute and learn about the out-of-body experience, and this might enhance, along with your meditation, the procedures of learning uh, scientific remote viewing. So I did that. I went to the Monroe Institute where they study the out-of-body experience and both the out-of-body experience and remote viewing involve getting information from taste, sight, touch, sound, and smell without being there firsthand. And the out-of-body is somewhat more of an astral travel type of thing, but they use sound waves and I won't get into that detail. I have detail of it at my website on how it's done. But you use a binary beat of different sound waves. One, it can be heard by the conscious mind. The other can only be heard by the subconscious mind. You play them within various frequencies of each other. What they do, this binary beat, it creates a cerebral wavelength inside your brain, actually, that creates a neurological effect that allows what's called theta brain wave information to be transferred to the beta brain wave state. You've got quickly four different brainwave states that are the majority of what would go in and out of all the time. Delta is below four hertz, which is when you're sleeping. Between four and seven hertz is the theta brainwave state. It's also called the hypnagogic state. It's basically right before you wake up and right before you fall asleep, you are more open to more different types of energies and surroundings that you have around you. Then you go into the alpha, which is the daydreaming between 8 and 13 hertz. And then you have the beta brainwave state between 14 and 32 hertz. Um, and so this binary beat allows information to be transferred from the theta brainwave state out to the beta brainwave state. So some of those things that you have while you're sleeping, you can bring it back. Or some of the things just before you fall asleep, just before you wake up, you can bring it back to the waking state. And this teaches you how to do it and you practice it by going through these different sessions with uh, the Monroe Institute tapes that include um, vocalization that the conscious mind can hear, soft tone music, and also subliminal messages that are only the subconscious mind can hear. And all that inclusiveness creates those brainwave legs that can be sometimes transferred to consciousness. Um, I know that's in depth a little bit, but I just want you to know there is science behind this. There's been a lot of research put into this by different universities, different people, different organizations, etc. We're going to look at an actual remote viewing session example here. And this is what you get. You get a target, two sets of four digits, and we'll go into all this in a little bit more. Let's say the target is actually the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa. When you go through different parts of it, you write down sketches, you write down protocols, you go through phases. So just giving your audience here a little bit of what this entails. And a, a remote viewing session, a full session, what we're doing tonight won't be this, but it will do enough so you get the gist of it. It's usually 45 to 60 minutes like you and I do, Jason, when we do a session, it's usually 45 to 60 minutes. And mm -hmm. I got to admit, Jason's been one of the best students I've ever had. He's picked this up quickly. He has such good success in some of these sessions, and we get into some deep sessions as well. The general rule of thumb is... Um, you know, 33%, you can guess and probably get some information right. 33%, you may just be wrong. 
It's the other 33% that separates, you know, what's called a good session from maybe a so-so session or a not so good session. Once again, if you want more information about the history of remote viewing, that's the Russell Targ video at my website. Projects that I've been involved with myself personally, um, secrets that are paranormal type of projects. Most of the stuff I've been involved with does not include the paranormal or UFOs, but I have definite information, um, short videos, um, papers and things like that all up at my website, uh, Secrets of Redgate, UFOs, they were out in Montana. Also, artificiality on Mars, question mark. I worked with several military remote viewers on this particular project. It was through several schools, including the Hawaiian Guild, Association of Remote Viewers, um, Controlled Remote Viewing out of California, and um, Scientific Remote Viewing out of Atlanta, Georgia. And it's good information about what might be actually terraforming going on right now on the planet Mars. And for your information, uh, the real reason why I teach basic scientific remote viewing is the potential byproducts anybody can get out of this. And it may help one's cognitive abilities, their intuition to be developed, memory, recall, the ability to focus. You may also notice more synchronicity in your life. All these things are already there. It's kind of like when you exercise a muscle. You have to muscle it or it just becomes atrophied. You know, it just doesn't become very useful. But if you exercise these different faculties inside your brain and do these type of exercises, you, anybody has the capacity to be able to do, to a certain extent, some remote viewing. And some of it really can surprise you what you can come up with. Okay, let's begin our first basic uh, introduction to scientific remote viewing. And there are many styles, doesn't mean anyone is any better than the other. It's basically, they're all based off the original Stanford Research Institute program out of California back in the early 1970s. When we go through this, there'll be like a blue outline box you'll see on the slide with my little emojis and the actual process that's going on. Then you'll have blue and a deeper blue box, a lighter blue, I'm sorry, that actually shows an example what you'll do next, and then a completed example for each one as well. So it'll be pretty easy to follow. During your remote viewing session, you never really want to be concerned about ever naming or guessing or labeling what a target is. The only thing you're concerned is, is to bring back information that you're sensing. And there's a place for all of these things for people. Our egos always want to name things. We want to be in charge. We want to be in control. And we just deduct those. We go off to the right-hand side and deduct them. It doesn't mean it's good information or not so good information. The thing is, when you start labeling or guessing and you have straight answers with this, you want to just deduct them off to the right side. You put D hyphen, write down whatever it is, drop your pen for 5, 10 seconds, pick it back up, take a couple breaths, and we do, we, you know, resume right where you leave off. Tony, I remember you when, when, when we were, when I was first learning remote viewing with you. Yeah. When I touched my pen on the paper, you said, Jason, if you hold that pen there longer than 1.6 seconds, your conscious mind answers that question for you. You have to get that information before that. Right, right. Well, it, yeah, anywhere. Some people, yeah, it's 1.5. Some people might be three seconds. The whole idea is not to think too much about it. Just relax your mind and almost let the information come to you. And then you have to be able to be um, aware enough subconsciously to get that information from that subconscious aspect of your being to your conscious mind and then just write it down. So when we do the demo walkthrough, we're just going to practice some ideogram sketches. I'll go over all this with everybody. We're going to review what target coordinates are. There's just two sets of four digits. IL is an ideogram label. A is a description of the pen, of the movement of the ideogram you just created. Then we'll probe the ideogram. They'll take the tip of the pen and touch what you sketched out for a second or two each time and write down what you sensed and that's for primitive and advanced descriptors and you'll learn how to deduct on the right hand side don't worry i will walk everybody through every step of the way with this there'll be a slide for every single step with a demonstration of what it should be looking like so phase 1a is right here And what we want everybody to do is simply to sketch out what we call ideograms. Ideograms are basically your first connection with what your target is after you get two sets of four numbers. And you write those numbers on top of each other, and that'll be like this here. You'll put that on the side of your sheet of paper, and you'll sketch out one of these ideograms right here next to that. 
So what everybody just simply wants to do, just to get some type of familiarization with remote viewing, the very basic of it, is to just sketch out right here, the same thing that you see in front of you. These loops right here are for a subject. So when you sense a subject, the half a box or a half a square is a structure. Yep, exactly what Jason's pointing out. A small straight dry land a, a line is just simply dry land. A wavy line is water. Up and down, like an upside down V is a mountain or pyramid and energy is a squiggly line. So if everybody has a chance just to sketch those out, each one 10 times, just to get used to it because you're gonna be doing this very shortly as you actually do your first remote viewing sessions. We just wanna get used to these type of sketching sketching, writing down is all what remote viewing is, but you're bringing this information again from the subconscious to the conscious, to pen, to paper. So we'll give everybody definitely a few more seconds just to do this particular exercise on one sheet of paper. And then after you're done with this sheet of paper, you go on to another sheet of paper for what we're going to learn next. But these are your first sensing perceptions of what your target is right after I give you what's called target coordinates. So while they're, while they're practicing, Tony, so basically, as soon as you get, like you just said, as soon as you give, when we get to that step, as soon as you give a target coordinates, which are those four numbers, one of these uh, ideograms, it'll just come to them and they must right. let your hand just be free. Yep. Let your hand and just flow. And whatever happens with that pen happens. Yes. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide. The target coordinates look like that. And you just do one of the um, ideograms on the bottom there, right next to it, to the, to the right of it, actually, on your sheet of paper. And it'll be like this, not quite like this yet, but you'll sketch out the target coordinates. Then off to the right of it, you'll sketch out one of the ideograms. And it ends up, it's this simple, everybody. It ends up just looking like this on your sheet of paper. 3908-0462, sketch out an ideogram. I say the target coordinates allowed. You write one set of four on top of the other set of four, and you quickly sketch out an ideogram right next to that. The ideogram is an inch or two, maybe by an inch or two, and that's it. This is what it looks like. That's what I mean by I'll walk you through every step of the way. And I always do that when I teach. Then what you'll do after you have your target coordinates and you sketch an ideogram next to it, you'll go off to the right, the far right of the sheet of paper, and you'll write the letters IL for ideogram label, colon, and you'll write down whatever that ideogram was. Was it a subject? Was it structure? Was it dry land? Was it water? Was it a mountain or pyramid? Was it energy or motion? And you just write down one of those of what that ideogram label was. Then about an inch underneath that, you'll write the letter A colon, line it up with the IL colon, and you'll describe the movement of the pen with words. And this is where you put four or five different words in there. It could be up, down, you can just use an L for left, an R for right, a loop, slant is a straight line off to the side, slope is a curved line off to the side. And what this does is it brings you from a subconscious aspect the people or people are practicing are going to do the session or will learn the process. It brings the viewer closer to what the actual target is because you're describing it now in a movement of pen with words. And it doesn't mean you even have to be right. You don't even have to get the ideogram right for what the target is initially because you can, as you go through the process, you'll get more information that comes along with it. So this is what it looks like so far. It'll be simply with just your sheet of paper would just look like this. I give two sets of four digits. An ideogram is sketched out to the immediate right, less than three seconds in time. Go off to the far right, IL colon, say structure, whatever the ideogram is, or if it was a subject, or if it was water, or dry land, mountain, or energy. Then A colon, describing the movement of pens, up, right, point, down, straight. However you want to describe it, how you feel comfortable describing it. Then what we do is we simply learn how to do probing. What we do is we take the pen or pencil that we have in hand, we take the tip of it, and we touch the ideogram, the marking of the ideogram, wherever the line is, and you touch it for a second or two and do that two or three times. And what you'll do is you'll get primitive descriptors, and I'll just show you what those are. It's either going to be S for soft, SS semi-soft, H for hard, SH semi-hard, 
W for wet, M for mushy. Those are primitive descriptors. And you'll probe the ideogram two or three times for a second or two each time with the tip of the pen or pencil. And it's either going to be soft, semi-soft, hard, semi-hard, wet, mushy. And this goes one inch below where A colon was. Then you'll probe the ideogram again for what's called advanced descriptors. It's either going to be natural, which is M. MM is man-made. A is artificial. E is for energetics. M for motion. So again, you take simply take the tip of the pen, probe the ideogram two or three times, a second or two each time again, and either it's natural, man-made, artificial, energetics, or motion. Your subconscious mind is actually gaining information from what this target is. And it looks just like this. That's as simple as it gets. It's not too expensive. You've got your, again, your target coordinates, sketched out your ideogram, ideogram label colon, A colon describe the movement of the pen with words. And again, I'll walk you through. Probe it for primitive descriptors, hard, semi-hard, wet, uh, soft, semi-soft. In advanced descriptors, probing again. And this time we had a deduction. You thought it, maybe the person thought it was a stone. You write D hyphen, write the word stone. You drop your pen, take a couple breaths, five, 10 seconds or so, 15 maybe, pick it back up and resume where we left off. So quick review right here, never concern yourself with naming what a target is. There's a place for that called deductions off to the right hand side. When you do have a deduction, you drop your pen, you wait for 5, 10, 15 seconds, take a couple breaths, and you resume right back with you, uh, where you left off at. And you're always more concerned with sketching, probing, sensing what you're getting from your five senses of taste, sight, touch, sound, smell, without worrying about labeling or naming. I, the monitor, I'll often say while well, we do this, even tonight, listen to your intuition and subtle senses. Do not edit anything, deduct everything, and we follow the structure, uh, the protocols and phases. And the reason why we follow the protocols and phases, the protocols of what we're doing are phase one, what I just described. What they actually do is they, for the viewer, they keep your audience, they'll keep your conscious mind occupied all the while information comes to and through to the subconscious mind. So there's another reason why these actual physical protocols are put in place. And it's been time and tested again by many different people. They keep the conscious mind occupied all the while the information comes to and through to the subconscious mind. Phase three, we're skipping phase two now because we don't need to go through that now. will be a sketch. And these are the two things you'll learn. Phase one. A here and then phase three. You'll start sketching out your target on a whole new sheet of paper and you'll always deduct if anything comes to your mind that's a label or and or a guess. And again it's a new sheet of paper. When you're doing your sketch we're never concerned about your artistic ability. Um, you're not concerned about your grammar. You're not concerned about your neatness. The only thing you want is just to get information down. That's the main thing. Because as you do this, you could be in a type of hypnotic state, actually, during some of these sessions. You'll get so focused. And we're not concerned about grammar. We're not concerned about spelling. We're not concerned about real artistic ability or things like that. And this is how it works. You don't want to use ideograms if you don't have to when you sketch. This right here, the red, this is not necessary. If you need to just you know sketch out a structure, let's say, for instance, you sense a building, it doesn't have to be this detailed because that gets your conscious mind too involved. Just this to the right where it's green, acceptable, that's fine for a structure. So no ideograms and no extensive artistic work either. Just a simple structure of whatever it might be, a plane, a boat, a spaceship, uh, a home, uh, a building, etc. Same thing here, no ideogram for subject. If you get a subject, it doesn't have to be sketched like this right here. That's too extensive, too much work. Subject can be a stick man or something like this. If you need to deduct, you think it's a President Lincoln or whatever else, you just write that down, drop your pen, pick it back up and resume where you left off. Slight petroleum smell. It doesn't have to be printed this neat right here. It can be just written across the page just like this right here at the bottom. That's what is acceptable. So again, we're not looking when you do remote viewing, for anybody to be an extreme artist, we're not looking for extensive spelling or grammar. 
We're not looking for neatness. We're looking for the data to be put down so you make sure you don't lose that connection. You don't worry about those other types of things that I just mentioned here. Neatness, grammar, artistic ability, things like that. Spelling. And that's what we just went over right here a couple seconds ago. Next is an actual demo. Let's say that was the target. We would have went through those simple phases, phases 1A and phase 3. And this, I'll show you at the end, you're each going to get targets with an actual picture that has the actual target coordinates. And this is what it would have looked like. That was just a demo target that I just demonstrated all through phase 1. This was the target. Um, we did the ideogram. Uh, then we did the ideogram label. The A described the meaning of the permanent words. We called the ideogram for primitive and advanced descriptors. Then we went on to phase three and started sketching out what you thought you sensed. And anything that you would have gotten, let's say we actually had a session that was a demo structure, stone, granite, marble, doors, windows, gray, blue, tan, green, warm, Texas, war, battle, historic, any of those things you would have put down or had a feel for, you would have deducted it maybe. Those would all have been good indicators that you had gotten some information about what the target was. Next, everybody in the audience, you're going to actually practice. We're going to do a practice session, then we'll take a short break, and then we're going to do an actual session as well. This next target, I'm going to give you a little bit of front-loaded information. It has something to do with dry land. So just so you all know, that's called a somewhat front-loaded uh, bits and pieces of information. So let us begin this. Have a clean sheet of paper. We're going to do phase one now, everybody. Okay, we're going to go into a practice. Yes, right. we are. Take a couple breaths, and we do, and before we do the actual session, we'll do a little bit of a meditation. We'll yep. do actually also what's called um, the basic SRV affirmation, so you get a taste for it. But this is still more of a practice demo, but a participating practice and demo for the audience if they wish to. So you grab that new sheet of paper. I never told you this, Tony, but... Um... The affirmation is my favorite part of the whole thing. Oh, yeah. Well, it definitely <laughs> affirms that you know we're more than the whole thing, that we're more than phys uh, physical beings. I mean, that's the whole thing about this. I mean, when I ever, whenever I teach this, I make sure we're grounded in white light, protected light. Um, yeah. You know, we're not gonna... it's, like a pep, it's like a coach giving you a pep talk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We, we got the meditation in it. The SRV affirmation comes after that. Because we're entering a certain aspect of our being into a, another dimension, actually, of existence. So you want to make sure you're always grounded and always protected. Cool. And you always are, because we're of the essence of source anyways. Because that's why, you know, that's the biggest thing is learning that we're more than physical beings. And this is called scientific remote viewing, and it helps prove this from a scientific aspect. So now, everybody, you're going to receive your target coordinates, and they're going to be two sets of four numbers, and you're just going to put them about three or four inches from the top of your clean sheet of paper on the, on the far left side. So what I want you to do is receive these target coordinates, two sets of four digits, and sketch out one of those ideograms, either a subject, structure, dry land, water, mountain or pyramid, energetic or motion, after you receive these two sets of four digits, sketch that out immediately to the right of your target coordinates less than three seconds. So I say prepare to receive your target coordinates. 9018, write this down, 0629, sketch out an ideogram immediately right to the right side of it. One of these ideograms are to the right side of these target coordinates right now. So everybody, you should have something that looks like this. Your target coordinates, different numbers, of course. Your ideogram right next to it, and it could be a different, this is just an example of whatever you got. So you got either a subject, structure, dry land, mountain or pyramid, energetic or motion, or water. Now what we want to do is you want to go to the right of your ideogram sketch to the right of the page, put IL colon, just like we looked at in the first demo one. And what was that ideogram, everybody, that you just sketched out? Was it a subject? Was it water? Was it dry land? Um, was it a mountain or pyramid? Was it energy or motion? Simply one of those words after the IL colon. And inch underneath that, A colon, 
Now just describe the movement of that pen, you know, of the ideogram with words. Is it moving up, down, however you wish to describe it, however comfortable you would describe your ideogram in three or four, maybe five different letter uh, words, um, how you would describe that movement of that ideogram. If we're moving a little fast, guys, just, just go in the chat, but this is only a practice, okay? Just go in the chat and say, hey, slow down. <clears throat> And so we're going to look something like this so far. I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but this is actually what it just, it's this simple to look like this actually so far. So we're going to do the next movement exercise, and that's where we probe. We're going to probe the ideogram that's next to the two target coordinate numbers. We're going to take the tip of the pen or the pencil. And you're going to touch your ideogram ever so slightly. Whenever we see this blue box here with the white hand in there, that's when you're actually probing. When you're sketching, you actually see the in color hand with a pen, and that's sketching. But we're probing right now. So probe the ideogram for primitive descriptors. And those primitive descriptors are either going to be S for soft, SS semi soft, H for hard, SH semi hard, W for wet, M for mushy. So you're taking the tip of the pen, you're probing the ideogram, and what are you sensing? Is it soft, semi-soft, hard, semi-hard, wet, or mushy? Touch that pen on that ideogram, guys. Exactly. And then you're going to do the same thing once again, only this time it's for advanced descriptors. So now in your mind, is it either going to be N for natural, MM for man-made, a for artificial, B e for energy, M for motion. You're probing the ideogram now for your advanced descriptors. First it was for the primitive descriptors, now it's for the advanced descriptors. And again, with a slide in front of you, always what you see in blue is where you're at. The other part is what we've already done. Okay, so it should look something like this. And if you get sometimes two answers for these particular probes or whatever that you're doing probing, please feel free, everybody that's watching this, to write down so you think it's natural and man-made. But maybe there's two things going on there. So you write them both down. If you had an inkling for something, a second part of it, please feel free. You always want to write down the information you get. That's why I will often say, uh, do not edit anything and deduct everything. So make sure all data, no matter how insignificant or silly or unimportant you might think it is, you never know. Just get it down. Because the one thing you don't want to do is say, oh, I had that, but I just didn't feel like writing it down. You always want to write it down, no matter how insignificant it might seem. So, so the, far, the session is like this. One of the guests says, I missed that step. Don't worry about it. He's this just a practice uh, session. This is not the real session, so don't worry about missing a step. Well, we're going to go back. So we're going to do probing for printed descriptors, soft, semi-soft, hard, semi-hard, wet, or mushy, and probing the ram for advanced descriptors, natural, man-made, artificial, energetic, or motion. And so we should be about right there now. Got the coordinates, the ideogram, ideogram label. Description of the movement of the pen with words under A. We probe the ideogram for primitive descriptors, and we probe the ideogram again for advanced descriptors. Okay, so hopefully everybody's with us here. Next, we're going to get a whole new sheet of paper, everybody. So put that other sheet aside. And now what you want to do is you want to start sketching out. Again, this is just examples in front of you, what you sense that target is. And it doesn't have to be just one sketch. It could be two sketches, maybe even up to three sketches, three parts of it, or one main part of it, and that's all you get. But start feeling around the page. You can actually, as a viewer, because you're all doing basic scientific remote viewing right now, feel around the page. Close your eyes. We're not rushing here. We're going to spend a few minutes here. When you sense something, sketch it out, no matter how how subtle it is. That's the whole thing with this. You're getting a lot of subtle data and information. And I'm talking a lot now, but I won't talk as much during the next one, which will be more of an actual session. Touch the page. 
listen to your intuition and subtle senses. And if anything has a label or a name, write it down. Just put D hyphen, write it down. Drop your pen for a few seconds. Take a couple breaths. Relax. And I'm going to be quiet now for a good two minutes. And I want everybody just to take it in. Because believe me, an aspect of every one of you, your being knows already what this target is. You're trying to get that information, break that veil from the subconscious to the conscious mind to pen to paper. And this is the very beginning stages of learning how to do this. So for the next two minutes, sense what you're getting, write it out, sketch it out. And if you're not getting anything, don't force it. And if for the next two minutes, if it just comes to you one time or halfway through this, then sketch it out. Will I be disqualified if I just drew Barney? Barney? <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> You know, it actually, actually came about with some of the old. <laughs> yeah, everybody just listen to your intuition and just let the information flow. And we're never worried about how well you should never be worried about how well you're doing with this. The thing is you're exercising, you're practicing, you're developing a sixth sense, you're developing extrasensory perception, uh, focus, memory. Mm -hmm. Intuition. So awesome. I have a minute and that's it. And I'll go over what this target was. Few more seconds, everybody. Hmm. Okay. Now we're going to go on to the next slide. I want everybody now on the middle of that page that they just had their sketch on. Go to the bottom of the page and simply write out at the bottom. Remember, we do what the blue box says across the screen here. Put end of session colon and the time. Wherever you're watching this from, um, it might be Central Standard Time, Eastern Standard Time, whatever the time is, or Pacific Time. Whatever time you have, just put the time, end of session, you know, write that out, colon, and then the actual time of the end of session. Okay, here's your first practice target, everybody. So here's what it, what it was. The delicate arch out of Utah National Park. That's the target coordinates we had. Oh, wow. So these are all the things you have. We had a little bit of a front load there. We said it was on dry land. We said dry land. So if anybody got any of the following things, Tall, something tall they drew, or towering, some type of a mountain that they drew it, dry land or circle, colors blue, orange, tan, brown. And those are more of a phase two thing, which we didn't do, but an outdoors park, open area, circle, arch. Any, anybody have a real quiet, peaceful feel of this particular target? Anybody that was hot or warm? You've got different senses. You know, some people are better at some parts of this than others. Um, and they, or they develop these areas quicker, valley, nature, opening, keyhole, all those things would have been good for this type of target. Does anybody want to share anything about what they had in the chat? That would be great. Yeah, if, you, if you're in the chat, go ahead and um, if you have any of this, go ahead and put it in the chat so we can show it. Now, Tony, I'm going to show you what I just did. It's almost scary. <laughs> but you said towering, and here's mine right here. Let me see if we can't. I drew a top somewhat of a, it looks just like it, huh? Somewhat like it. Absolutely, because there's an opening in the middle. It's tall. Um, you know, Jason, you're always scary with this stuff. I'll tell you <laughs> what. 
Wow. Whoa. Uh, you know what? This is funny. Uh, my my uh, my sister, which is my uh, co-host, l- look at what she put. She just put, uh, look what she put, Tony. I'm sweating. <laughs> okay, because you're hot. Okay. No okay. question about it. I mean, that's. She said she drew a ladder. Okay, good. Okay, good. Absolutely. That's upward. No question about it. That and hot means you made, obviously, some type of a connection with this. Okay. Right, right. Hot, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> and when Tony says you guys make connections, that means that your subconscious mind is actually there. It's it is. It actually is. You go to these targets and you bring back that information. The question is, can you bring it back through these scientific protocols? That's why it's called scientific remote viewing and bring that data back through that filter, which we call the conscious mind. And that's why we deduct and all this type of stuff. So this teaches you how to do that, that discipline. And again, it includes cognitive ability, intuition, memory, focus, um, you know, all those type of things, noticing more synchronicity because you're more open to it. You're starting to train that aspect of your being. And from a student aspect of it, I'm sitting here just like we're in class, Tony, you're my instructor, my monitor. And when I touched the page, I saw something tall with legs and it it looked like a tower, you know, it immediately looked like a tower and I just started drawing it. Right. But what I didn't do was try to get too descriptive or my conscious mind would have taken over. Right. You're right. You're, you're, you went about it the exact same, the exact appropriate way of doing it. Just let the data flow to you without being too, too involved and trying to name or guess. But that's why we have those deductions. It's just a matter of relaxing and letting the data flow to and through you because a certain aspect of all of us know always what the target is. It's just a matter of bringing that back. Did anybody else get anything? Just put it in the chat if you got anything. I think Tony. Yeah, I'd love for people to share, anybody who's participating to share whatever they got. Just um, And then again, any of these things are good information. Mountain, dry land, colors of blue, orange, tan, brown. That's more for the phase two as we get into the, you know, a deeper, if somebody were to take the course, you would see there would be a place for a lot of these different pieces of information. But if anybody was quiet, peaceful, or like your sister said, hot, warm, sweating, you know, a serene feel, a valley, nature feel, any of those type of things, a circle, and again, now, all in towering. Now, for, for you physically to be sweating while you're doing this, that's that's pretty... You know, my it's sister is, intense, really. yes, but she's, uh, she's, uh, she's gifted as well. So yeah, for her, to, it's almost surprising. Right. So for, it's almost like a phase four when you're pulling more information out. What do you feel? What do you? Oh yeah. We would have gone into that. Yes. With that type of verb. That's, that's good obviously. stuff, T. Yes. Yes. And it's almost like when you say, when you ask me to smell or to taste what do you taste what do you smell jason oh, yeah. we go into all that during phase two but that's more you know, sure. we, we can only go so deep into this you sure. know, with an introductory and so it has to be done in steps because i remember when i went out there and learned it was phase one one day phase two the next day right phase three it was all you know in, encompassing of the previous phases as we went through and learned it all right so what we want to do now is actually everybody, and hopefully we got some people participating. If not, participate in the next one. We're going to take a break for three or four minutes, and then we're going to come back, and it's going to be another 15, 20-minute session with a short meditation first, and then an SRV affirmation after that, and then an actual target again, just like we just did right now, phase 1A and phase 3, and we'll have a second target for everybody. So we want to take a little bit of a break, let everybody, if they need to... Um, refresh, get some water, get some liquid. It's important to stay hydrated. Um, I should have mentioned that from the get-go, but you know, now you can get get a chance to get some hydration and whoever's participating and or even if they're just watching what's going on. So you and I'll talk. Um if unless you you... absolutely I'm I'm good. Yes. Okay. So let's we'll move from that and get back on the screen. Tony, you know I've I've tried to pick your brain a whole lot and um you know one of the things that fascinates me uh, and I, and some of the people may know this guy, Major Ed Dames. Oh, absolutely. Now, Ed, I don't want to call him Ed, Major Dames, he uses associate remote viewing. Right. But he, but the group of people he has with him, they, 
they turn it into more of a, and I don't want to say show, but they turn it into more of an actual experience Mm -hmm. while they're actually doing their, it's almost like a remote viewing show. Um, What's your take on that? I think we're, you know, I'm, I have great respect for Ed Gaines. I've met him before at the, um, you know, the Scientific Remote Viewing, International Remote Viewing Association Conference. Um, he won't know me, but he was Courtney Brown's instructor when the book Cosmic Voyage, Ed was with Courtney with that. So, um, you know, not many people know that. Uh, again, I have great respect. I mean, he does do like everybody else is not as good as his part of it. Um, you know, that's all up for debate, you know, whether his group is better or this group is better. None of them are better than any other, in my opinion. Yeah. All that matters is just the person is, um, how should I say, disciplined enough to go through whatever um, course that they want. And then it's bringing back information. It's, it's all, all of it has always been based on Stanford research. Ed was taught by Ingo Swan, okay, and, and the group out of SRI, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff. So all of it goes back to a, 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 a you know part of the controlled associative scientific remote viewing. It's all they're all part of what Stanford Research Institute initially put together. But the different military officers branched out and each called them a different name for their own sakes to have their own programs. Yeah, and then they tweak them. And tweak them. The bottom line is accessing the subconscious mind. Um, number yeah, two, the information back to the conscious mind. You know, uh, when you, when we were, when I, when I read, uh, Dr. Courtney Brown's, uh, uh, book, you gave it to me while you were, you know, teaching me how to do this. Right. Right. So in reading Dr. Courtney Brown's book, uh, I stumbled, I stumbled, I stumbled upon transcendental meditation. Yes. And I told you, I'm like, you know, listen, I'm, I'm taking this. <laughs> you were like, yeah, I've already taken a uh, TM Jason. So go right. knock yourself out. When I went and took transcendental meditation, I was already meditating. I was already right. a little bit advanced. But when I, t- I got to say, Jason, I give you a ton of credit for doing so much with this. I mean, it's something that you've taken to and that you like, and um, your enthusiasm is is good. And I feel your enthusiasm, so it, it, you know it inspires me too. So <laughs> yeah, but my point was is that uh, meditation plays a big part in any yeah. modality that you're trying to use. Uh, you have to be able to get to a place where you're quiet and you're able yes. to access information. So, yep, actually, so so true. That's why you know they recommended me taking a course in meditation. Or all of us before they went out, for any of us before any of us learned with scientific remote viewing. Yeah. Was, and the people that actually had um, not taken meditation when I was out there, I remember this fellow named Martin. He was a uh, like a roadie, I think. He you know traveled around with like different groups that gave concerts and things like that he actually had trouble at first and then they brought in a transcendental meditation teacher so he took the course simultaneously while he was learning scientific remote viewing and without question it helped him because he had to quiet his mind he was like very hyper with everything um, but he knew that it had a, a very strong effect even in during just that one week of doing it and crash course and it definitely helped him with his scientific remote viewing course Okay. Well, let's get back to these these guys right here. Okay. okay. <clears throat> okay. Before we begin this next class, you know, everybody loosen up, stretch a little bit if they want, if they hadn't done that already. Um, make sure you have a couple, two or three new sheets of paper. Get more paper. Yep. Have that pen or pencil ready. Again, you just want to be relaxed in our minds. We want to have some fun with this. And we're actually going to be doing phase one and three again with this um, remote viewing session here right now. And we're all going to meditate together right now. However many people are watching, even if they have to watch it on tape, we all want to do a short you know, three, four, five minute meditation where you're just sitting and practicing with your breathing, everybody, and you picture white light all around you. And I'll lead you through this. You can do Pamiana breathing if you want. The whole thing is to breathe in through your nose, hold it for a second or two, and then exhale through your mouth. Because this is going to be like we're doing an actual session right now. If anybody were to take the course, it's going to be more like this after we do our learning, then before we do a session, just like Jason and I do all the time, we do some meditation. 
for several minutes. Everybody, we're just breathing. There's a white light within you. There's a white light all around you. This energy is our essence. We can call it whatever we want. Spirit, soul, subconscious aspect. All part of the divine source that's in, in part of every one of us. And just focus on your breathing because this all helps a person get relaxed. So I'm not going to say too much anymore. We're going to actually do a couple minutes of just breathing and relaxing. And then we'll do an affirmation right after that and get into the session. Few more breaths for everybody. Breathe in through your nose deeply. Hold it for several seconds and breathe out through your mouth. When the white light is all around you, it's within you. You're grounded, protected by this light. Couple more breaths. Breathe into the nose, hold it for several seconds, and exhale through your mouth. Okay, very good. You should be a bit relaxed. Next, I'm going to read what's called the SRV Affirmation. I am a spiritual being. Because I'm a spiritual being, I'm able to perceive beyond all boundaries of time and space. My consciousness is ever-present with all that is, with all that ever was, and with all that ever will be. It is my nature, as a human, to be able to perceive and does to know all that there is to know. Everywhere at all times I seek to learn and thus to evolve. To further my own personal growth and assist others in their growth, I direct my attention to a chosen point of existence. I observe what is there. I study it carefully. I record what I find. Okay, everybody, that clean sheet of paper. Prepare to receive your target coordinates. You're going to put it about two or three inches down from the top to the far left-hand side. Two sets of four digits are coming up and you'll sketch out an ideogram right next to that. So prepare to receive your target coordinates. Three, one, seven, five, two, eight, five, one, ideogram. Okay, let's go off to the right of the ideogram directly across from the right, right, I, L, colon. Did you get a subject, structure, Dry land, water, mountain or pyramid, energy, emotion. What was the ideogram label? I L. All right, one inch under that, put the letter A colon. It should look like that, where we're at. Now, A colon. Let's describe the movement of the pen with words. Is it moving up, 
that ideogram down, is it to the left, to the right, is there a point, a loop, is there a slant, which is a straight line off to the side, is it slope, a curved line off to the side. Again, blue is what we're doing next. Describe the movement of the pen with words. A colon, that's what that is. Up, down, left, right, loop, slant, slope, pointed, jagged, however best to describe it. No rushing, but at a decent pace. Okay, everybody, it should look something like this. This is, again, just an example. The ideogram could be totally different. Obviously, the coordinates are different, but this is what we should be looking like so far. You've got your target coordinates, quick ideogram, ideogram label, colon, A colon, describe the movement of the pen with words. Next, we're going to probe the ideogram. For primitive descriptors, take the tip of the pen. You're going to touch the ideogram two or three times for a second or two each time. And either it's S for soft, and this is an inch underneath the A. I'm sorry, an inch underneath the A. SS semi soft, H for hard, SH semi hard, W for wet, M for mushy. It's called probing the ideogram for primitive descriptors. All right, underneath that, we're going to probe the ideogram once again, about an inch underneath that. We're going to probe the ideogram for advanced descriptors. Is it N for natural, MM for man-made, A for artificial, E for energetics, M for motion? Again, we're taking the tip of the pen, touching the ideogram for a second or two each time. Do that two or three times. N for natural, M M man made, A artificial, E energetics, M motion. I'm not going to rush. And if it's a couple of these, feel free to do so. And if you're getting anything that's a conscious thought, that's a label or a guess that's coming on strong, Write D somewhere on the page, preferably off to the right hand side. D hyphen, write out what it is. Doesn't mean it's good or bad information. You just want to get it out of your conscious mind. And pick the pen back up and let's resume. And so far we should look like this. Again, if you have a deduction, it could be just like that off to the right. And this is where we're at with phase one. We got your coordinates, ideogram sketch, ideogram label. A colon, describing the movement of the pen with words. You probe the ideogram for primitive descriptor. Probe the ideogram for advanced descriptor. You may have gotten one or two things in each one of them. And D hyphen, any deductions. You could have three deductions, five deductions, or no deductions. Okay. Now, everybody, let's grab a new sheet of paper. And we're going to take the pen and we're going to start sketching. It could be landscape style or portrait style, whatever you feel comfortable with. Let's start feeling around the page. And let's start sketching what we see. Excellent. Thank you, Jason. Yes, thank you. Feel around the page. Could you use one hand, two hands? Could you have a hand on with the pen and feeling around the page with the pen in hand while you feel it with your fingertips? Close your eyes, relax, and then spend several minutes here. Let the data come to you. And anything that's high level, do deduct it off to the right hand side. And now, and then even though this is part of phase two, now if you get any colors or temperatures or tastes, write them down as well. Just write them on the sheet. We don't want to sketch out ideograms. We want actual sketches, and they don't have to be artistic. We talked about that before. We're not interested. You're not interested. The monitor is not interested in artistic ability, just information. Listen to your intuition and subtle senses. Do not edit anything. Don't leave it out and deduct everything. 
breathe easy naturally let the data flow I always like to let everybody know there's an aspect of your being that already knows what this target is. It's just a matter of letting it come to and through your subconscious, through your conscious mind, to the pen, onto the paper. Target can be anything. Another minute or two, everybody. Again, listen to your intuition and subtle senses. What are you sensing from this target? Let the information flow to you. Quiet your conscious mind. Another minute or so, and don't force anything. And sometimes this stuff comes out spontaneously. You could be close to the end of a session, and all of a sudden you just get something. Write it out, sketch it out. Deduction. And it's okay to put your pen down, take a deep breath, and then pick your pen back up. Yep, we got a few more seconds to go. If you need to do that, exactly what Jason said. No pressure. Take a couple breaths. Couple more seconds. Okay. Now, everybody, on the bottom of the page in the center, put the words end of session, colon, and then the time right after that or right underneath that, wherever it is where you're at. And so it should look something just like this, whatever you had, if there's any deductions, any sketches. And your completed phase three looks just like this with the end of session at the bottom and the time. Okay, everyone, now we're going to look and see what the target is for this phase one and three practice session that we just had, your first actual basic scientific remote viewing session. Oh, wow. Here's what it was. A man walking on a bit of a tightrope type of scenario out in South Korea. It's a tightrope act. So if people had things like subject, main thing, or subjects, because there's a crowd here. If anybody had any type of a straight line throughout this page, anything that was like a line, um, that's definitely very strong information, a very strong indicator you were at this target. A lot of greenage, foliage in the background. As we review subject, crowd, open air, if anybody had any type of balance or if they felt dizzy, uh, if you had a sense of athletics or walking or rope or string or thin, falling, outstretched, colors black, green, white, blue, again, those are more phase two, warm again, Korea, any type of an Asian sense to this, fan, hat, headdress, those things were all part of what this was, he was holding a fan, he had two hats on, the color blue, the color white, the color green. Okay, we got people coming in, um, Elisha Grismore says, I had long, 
and visitors. Okay, and long is definitely in the spring across. Visitors, you've got a bunch of people visiting, uh, you know, watching this event. And we, uh, Tasha Carroll says, I, had, I got green. Okay, good. You know, if we would have got, I mean, it's it's hard to do so much because, you know, Jason, I mean, what, we would love to get into phase two. Yeah. Already, so you could get, you know, I asked you, are you sensing colors? Are you sensing uh, taste? Are you sensing smells? All those things there would have been a place for it, but to just get it without even me asking, that's pretty good. I think Tereska had an icicle and a banana. <laughs> LOL. Uh, a waterfall came to mind. That's cool. You know, I uh, she had a very strong inclination for the first one. That's for sure. Yes, very strong. You know, on the advanced descriptor, descriptor, I I picked up motion and energetics. Um, now Tasha says I actually drew a tree, and that would okay. be yeah, that was that's, good. That's, that's obviously right there. Did you when you drew the tree? Did you have like the actual leaves and the foliage part of it too? I would be curious. Hmm. Yeah. So I'm glad we had participation with this. Oh, yeah. And some people probably just sitting there scratching their heads like, wow, okay, what well, just happened here? <laughs> you, know, I, you know, for every person that does actually come out and say they did something, there might be one or two or three that don't want to talk about it. They just want to actually do the session. That, that happens a lot. You know, not everybody likes to participate. Practice a man on a road with a hat, still feeling dizzy. That's pretty impressive. I like that. Wow. That's very impressive. And you know what? Uh, if she had the actual feeling of dizzy, uh, I, I, I said connected. that right here. I said, you know, dizzy right here on this yep. right here. You know, um, hat. I had that on there too. No question. A man on a road with a hat. I mean, that's incredible. Really, that's very impressive. Okay. Yes. Yes. You know, people, if if they took time to really, really, this is a fascinating skill to learn. Um, and you can, you know, no, we're, we're just sitting right here picking targets, but you can actually use this, Tony, uh, in a lot of different ways, right? Oh, we just used it a week and a half ago for somebody that um, I know you've been using and I participated a bit, too, because you got me involved with the, yeah. the missing pet. So and all the data that you came up with and I came up with. So, yeah, yeah uh, guys, we, I called Tony. I said, Tony, um, a, a client of mine has a missing dog in Mass. I think it was Mass, the Rhode Island. <laughs> well, no, you said a pet and just the East Coast. Right. We knew. Right. I, I came, you know, obviously we both came up with information. You had an incredible amount of information about it, but we both had power lines, power boxes. I got a dog. I'd be very curious if that dog was black and white color and around 40, between 40 and 60 pounds, just for the heck of it. I'd like to know that. But, Jason, you had some incredible information. You helped that lady out finding, obviously, finding a pet. But listen, Tony, I wouldn't have known how to even find that dog had I not. And I know we're talking about a, you know, a dog, but some people are very attached to their animals. I would not have oh, been so able to find. Yeah, I wouldn't. Have, I wouldn't have found that dog had it not been for your training. But something kept telling me I, I could see him by a fence, and he was, right. he was. A tree and a fence, and lo and behold, when she called back, he was stuck under a tree and couldn't move. Uh, Tasha says, I drew a trunk slanted, and the bottom was like a circle. Okay, cool. And again, you know, the real reason why I teach this I mean, it's great to do remote viewing sessions and learn remote viewing, but I've taken it, you know, one step further in my in my humble opinion is that it just increases a person's cognitive abilities and increases the person's intuition to can uh, memory and the recall the focus and noticing synchronicities all those things these byproducts that you get by exercising and learning remote viewing it's great to learn how to do remote viewing but the byproducts is how it will help possibly enhance one's day-to-day -day life type of idea and not to mention you know the meditation part of it the relaxation part of it, all those things. And a lot of your viewers are already participating with things like that. So I don't overly push anything. But if anybody wants to learn it, um, we'll make it fun. Uh, it's a combination of watching videos and live sessions with me like we just did right here, one-on-one -on -one with Zoom. 
Um, I usually give three of the eight, um, it's 11 classes or 11 sessions. Three of the eight are live with me. I will definitely give anybody who comes aboard another session or two to be live with me if they watch the show and want to participate. And we'll make sure you know how to do this and uh, are comfortable with it. And as you can see, I walk anybody all the way through this, each and every step that we always learn, there's always a PowerPoint presentation that goes with it, whether it's live or on video. All right. So it's like I make the per, you know, the personal training comparison. How you learn how to exercise your body and the muscles and things like that. This is the same thing, only you're exercising your intuitive aspect, your being, your um, subspace, subconscious, breaking that veil between your subconscious mind and your conscious mind, and bringing it back to pen and paper. That's why you go through the protocols and phases because they keep the conscious mind occupied while the information comes to and through the subconscious, and that's why it's called scientific remote viewing. But I do want to say um, thank you, everybody, for taking time to uh, participate and to learn some of the basics of basic scientific remote viewing. Hopefully everybody enjoyed it. We always want to have fun when we do this. It is work, but we want to have fun when we do it as well and not get overly attached to results, but that's always fun also. Um, but Jason, again, thank you for having me on here. Thank I you. enjoyed doing this, working with your some of your audience here. Hopefully they had some fun with it as well. All right. So, um, uh, Tony? I appreciate it. You and I will get together uh, tomorrow yes. and, and try to uh, get a uh, schedule our next time that we're going to hook up and meet. And yeah. uh, you can go ahead and you, do you have one party? Do you have a, any message for the audience before you get out of here? No, I, I would say um, you can get a hold of me through the um, website and the contact link or um, just Tony Civilelli at gmail.com. Anybody that has any questions, um, anybody that wants to discuss anything with me. I'd be free uh, to actually make time on a phone call or a Zoom call. Uh, if anybody has any, you know, type of um, ideas or how they can make it work, or if you have uh, a scheduling situation or how, however, whatever questions or ideas or thoughts that you have about it, I'm open to discussing with anybody. So, okay. Well, I'll go ahead and finish it out with the audience. Tony, thank you so much, and uh, we'll get together soon. Thank you. Thank you, Tosh Carroll. Thank you all, our audience, your sister, everybody, patients, etc. Thank you very much for participating and uh, best to you all. Thank you, Jason. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, that was Tony um, Civilelli. And uh, <laughs> you can do anything that you like to do. Um, it's It takes uh, practice. Uh, anything takes practice. Using your subconscious mind uh, to find information, to find targets. Uh, and I know this was a long session. It was, you know, Tony, uh, you know, talked and maybe some of you got a little tired, but this skill increases a lot about yourself. I mean, your intuition, uh, your memory, your recall. Uh, but there are so many different things you can use. Um, so many different ways you can use scientific remote viewing. You know, I, I used it to help a, a woman on the East Coast find her pet. Uh, I've used a variation of this to predict future events. Uh, I've used it to find keys uh, that I've lost. Um, and, um, you know, I've used it for a number of things. So if you think that you may be interested in uh, scientific remote viewing, I'm going to put Tony's website up once again uh, so that you guys can get a look at it. LearnRemoteViewing.net learn remote viewing.net I mean, he really took his time he really showed me how to access the depth of my subconscious mind um and one of the one of the, the tips i'll give you um it's not a tip because tony showed you but it's when you use this pen and you put this pen on the ideogram you touch the tip of that idiot you touch it with the tip of the pen information comes and tony would tell me it's the low level information that's the best information that normally happens when you first touch the touch the ideogram when you touch it 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 comes right to you it's there you have to be accepting accepting of the information though the information you know you can't overthink it and say no 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 i i know i, I didn't think about no elephant i want to i want to say car no when you touch when you touch the ideogram with your pen that information that comes right then and there 
That's the low level information. That's the information that's stored in your subconscious mind. This is a great show. Uh, and I and I hope you guys enjoyed it. I am Jason Medlock. You are listening to the expansion of consciousness where we'll see you again soon. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed it and take care and good night to you all. And uh, let me get this out, the outro. And we're out of here, guys. We're out. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.